Hello, thanks for being here. I'm grateful. Uh, before we begin this episode, just a quick heads up. I normally record these commentaries all the way through without interruption, and so it's very easy to follow the episodes if that's what you're doing. However, there was a slight interruption. Bernard, my dog, did a stretch, and he stretched so much, and it's such a funny, he was doing that sort of doggy thing where he was playing with imaginary things in his head, and he stretched so much he actually hurt himself with his stretching. Uh, and, and I got so distracted, I had to stop and check he was all right. So um, I stopped the episode about about eight minutes, 45 seconds in when when Marcus Scarman comes in uh, to confront Dr. Copley, uh, uh, D- Dr. Warlock, Peter Copley's character. So I stopped the episode and then sort of wound back to where I, you know, I, I thought I'd stopped stopped and uh, the, the exact point and, and sort of started again and tried to pick it up but in the edit um, there was a little bit of crossover so uh, the the episode might go out of sync by three or four seconds four or five seconds uh, if you're following along so sorry about that welcome to happy times and places a positively inclined doctor who episode commentary podcast in which i toby haydock have to guess my special guests favourite things about the story of their choice. Hello Toby and hello everyone. My name is Richard Bignall, the editor of Nothing at the End of the Lane, and this time round we're going to be watching part two of Pyramids of Mars. Well, welcome it's time for part two of Pyramids of Mars. Uh, Richard Bignall, who you heard there, is a great researcher for Doctor Who, who, if you've seen any of the DVDs and Blu-rays, then you have benefited from his fastidious research. He's also a top fellow. Um, but he's one ahead of me because he chose Dudley Simpson's music last week, and I chose the cliffhanger that we're about to see uh, repeated before we get into the action of episode two of this most wonderful slice of Doctor Who. I hope Egyptian Gothic is to your taste, because we're about to get another serving as we press play in three, two, one. Um, So it's still a bit of a treat for me to watch this in in episode form, because I only, as I say, I I did for those Sunday repeats, but something happened to part four. and I think because because I was a bit annoyed because I'd not I'd not you know I'd not paid such close attention I think because you know life was happening and I had Doc Two and I I'd got the edited version anyway and I and it was only afterwards that I thought but yeah I didn't have it in episode form and in, you know in the olden days I would have got a brand new videotape and I would have you know made sure I preserved it forever because I you know used to sometimes fantasize and think what well, what if everything everybody they lost every, every episode of Doc Two at the BBC my tapes might be all that's left. Um, but, but, you know, I had, I had other distractions and it, and, 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 and so then afterwards, um, I was annoyed I hadn't paid proper attention. So I didn't even really watch the first three episodes because it was a sort of reminder that I'd, uh, that I'd messed up. So it was only when I got this on DVD, which is the DVD I'm watching now that I've had for, gosh, years and years. Um, so beautiful death. Uh, goodbye to Peter Mayock, who uh, played Narmin so well. He comes back in the Deadly Assassin, unrecognisable with, without the beard uh, or the hair, as a, as, a, as, a, as a guard that's been taken over by the master that tries to interfere with the work of uh, Coordinator Engin and Castellan Spandrel in episode three of the Deadly Assassin, Solis the Guard. Um, and thereafter sort of disappears from the world of Doctor Who, having done two in close proximity, not for the same director. Interesting. He just sort of was was around and didn't wasn't, you know, doing an awful lot of other telly, which is interesting. Um, and I think everyone presumed he was around. And then when they were researching the DVD, uh, you know, they thought, let's interview this guy. And they found out that he'd, that he'd passed away, sadly. So relatively young. Um, don't know that much about him beyond that, apart from that he was, he was an Irish stage actor. Um, so I like these mummies. One of them is uh, the the main mummy is a guy called Nick Bunnell who had a very decent career. And uh, Nick, uh, I did a, a commentary with him for Phantom Films uh, on this, and he and he passed away shortly after. Sadly, he was a nice man, but he played Patrick Cargill in a, in a play about Tony Hancock that had uh, uh, Alfred Molina in. Was it uh, was it called Hancock's Last Half Hour? Um, that might not be the title. Google it. Um, and 
uh, he was in a low, a low. He's, he was in all sorts. He had a decent career, but this was this was one of his first jobs. Uh, but yeah, he's gone now. But uh, uh, the other two uh, mummies are Melvin Bedford, who pops up again for a different director in a small part in Planet of Evil, uh, and Kevin Selway, uh, who I would have known nothing about were it not for the fact that somebody who I who I'm in touch with on Facebook or Twitter um, shared. A, shared a hospital ward with him <laughs> uh and they got chatting and he, he you know he was a guy who was in doctor who so isn't that funny um i mean i, I and you know I'm, I'm not taking you to a, an awful hospital ward where nobody got out you know it was a, they were you know they, yeah, they were in hospital and they've, they've they've since left and everybody's fine um uh but uh when of course when this was out on dvd you know that, that peter Bay mayock being no longer with us was was an unusual thing uh for this cast so you've got interviews with michael sheard and bernard archard and peter copley um and and aren't we lucky that uh we you know we, the dvd started when they did because uh there are so many of those guys now no longer with us. Um, Tom Baker acts that stuff very well. I, it's 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 not it's not the it's not the best rendered of of, of the scenes in this uh, uh, production, uh, and and it's telling that there's actually nothing wrong with it, but it still stucks out as a sort of uh, one of the, the the sort of subpar moments because it's such a good production. Oh, and Shirley has come through the door, um, and this this is George Tovey. Are you are you in for good now? I can stop. Okay. Um, this is George Tovey as Ernie Clements, the poacher, who, when watching the VHS, you don't realise he's actually only in this episode um, and doesn't meet anybody else and dies. Uh, and he, he contributes... I was going to say he contributes nothing to the plot. That's not true because he is there and we use his explosives later on. So he's actually there for a purpose but largely to die horribly before the episode is out. He's only on film, so he probably didn't do any rehearsals. But, of course, he has a connection uh, with Doctor Who. Uh, literally, with Doctor Who. I love that man trap. Looks horrible, doesn't it? Uh, and I'd also say that's, that's that's quite an extreme thing for a poacher to have. And, and uh, you're right for being sued if you leave one of those lying around. Um, but uh, and that's going to that's gonna chop any poor rabbit in half, isn't it? Um uh but that's great because it shows the strength of the mummy and it gives him something to be scared of um but he he literally has a connection with doctor who because he george tovey is well you know from the surname he is the father of roberta tovey who plays Susie who susan in uh the the dalek movies uh, apologies for that interruption that was my other half shirley coming in and uh I don't like to break up the edits of these things if I possibly can. So you just got a little bit of a view into uh, life in Haydoke Towers there. Where, yes, if my partner comes in when I'm recording a podcast, she has to sod off. Um, whereas Bernard, my dog, has currently got his nose in uh, in the compost bin. It's clean. Um, anyway, so it's all go here. And it's all go for uh, poor old Ernie Clements, who uh, George Tovey is in the first ever production of Harold Pinter's the dumb waiter as well that's one of his pieces of uh, theatrical history but he's uh, he's good casting as the uh, he's got a great face hasn't he um uh you can imagine him rolling up rolling up a fag and sitting on a tree stump and uh, but he's you know he 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 doesn't get much to say he's probably only got a so he got does he say about six words he says only moses doesn't he professor scarman uh murdering swine i don't think any of his lines are more than two lines um but he gets, if you can hear a noise now, Bernard is deciding to rub himself against the carpet and having a bit of a roll around and, uh, and an argument with nothing. Um, I'm sorry, this is, a, uh, normally this is recorded under the most professional of conditions, i.e. when everyone's asleep. I love that simple little effect of, holy Moses, uh, throwing, it's, it's it, not too much attention is drawn to it. And I find that happens quite a lot in this era, whereas they'll have moments that are really good and really well rendered but instead of drawing too much attention to it going oh look at that it's it's so seamlessly melded into it that you go oh and it's only afterwards that you think oh how did they do that wow i didn't see the joins or and i'm and it's remarkable how 
little Peter Copley's in it actually as well. I mean, it's it's a beautiful. I I used to love watching stuff like this as a kid. All the films I remember as a kid were things like The Great Escape or The Poseidon Adventure, which were all about. Even though they had different trappings and different settings, that that the thrust of the drama was a group of people in a perilous situation, and s- some of them die. And so you get moments of high drama, i.e. the death of somebody, um, that, that punctuate it every now and again. And part of the fun, if fun is the word, is working out, you know, who's going to who's gonna buy it next. Um, so we've had Collins. He came in and was the lovely butler, dead. Uh, Dr. Warlock, uh, you know, who the, the whole of episode one is sort of almost about saving, um, who then the plot suddenly runs out of any use for. So he's he has a little bit of a kip and now he gets murdered. Um, and, you know, Peter Copley was, you know, an actor of, um, you know, repute and experience. So it's it's uh, it's quite remarkable how how small a part this is. Um, but it's not a small part. It's a really decent part and he plays it well. But he, um, he's got a great cameo in the, the first episode of Survivors as well, uh, where he's sort of... You know, he's deaf and he's old. And he says that brilliant line with, with great dignity, you know, I won't make a very good survivor. And your heart breaks. And it's, again, that sort of stoical thing that, that, we, we, that we can do, that we can do in, 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 you know, the sort of drama and with the sort of actors that, that, that we have or certainly had from, from this period. Um, I, I noticed in when, the, when, when Survivors was remade, the... Uh, the oh you see my 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 drama school friends thought that was awful i think that's absolutely fine um uh, and i think because he he moved his arm and they were all, so and go well i thought his arm was hurt and he said why are you looking f- for stuff and i think if you were imperiled even if your arm was in a sling you could you tense it do you know what i mean and, and again i think you have to be very ungenerous to sort of be i don't know why people watch things to look for things that if they gave them the benefit of the doubt wouldn't take them out of the drama but instead prefer to look for the thing that will take them out of the drama. What does that mean? You've got one up on the people making the fiction. You know that it's fiction. You you pointing that out and sort of willfully, um, uh, you know, knocking the suspenders off your disbelief is is uh, no but nobody's there's no victory there or it's a hollow one. Uh, I do that said. I do I uh, I do wish them that mummy mummy was tucked in at the midriff, uh, or it take a bit of bandage round. Um, there's me doing. Uh, oh, um so what was i to oh yes in 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 the survivors when they remade it that scene where you know an old man goes well i don't know even how to make a candle you know and yeah that line i won't make a very good survivor the parallel character was an outward bound guy played by a good friend of mine francis mcgee who basically went oh yeah i've got a tent and i can live off the land this this uh this you know this holocaust uh, uh won't make much difference to me and you go talk about undermining the very series that you you've created by having a character go yeah i'll be fine you go what that's that's completely not the message that you want to be conveying to the audience you want to be going this is awful how will we people that have that have become so reliant on technology cope with even the basics and the most fundamental so you go here's an outward bound guy who's just gonna live in a tent he'll be all right i, I, I mean cloth cloth eared um but don't get me started. Well, you just have. Um, uh, t- Tom Tom Baker's very very aesthetic impulse. Oh, he, he he does all the sort of scientific mumbo jumbo with such conviction, and they manage to make the words I don't know some somehow trip off his tongue as well. Um, Holmes has such a good ear for the sort of the language of melodrama, so that it all sounds great and and real. See these ones are. You, they're tucked in they're not coming they're not coming loose at the that, that last one is a little bit oh and we haven't even mentioned the brilliant bernard archard oh poor old uh, peter mayock uh, gets to play a corpse this week there are very few oh that, no they were a bit untucked at the back um there are a few actors that die at the end of episode one i could think of martin court in the seeds of death nick zaran uh he's at the end of a episode four i think i've mentioned this in the seeds of death podcast um uh in the space pirates who die at the end of episode one and come back as a corpse um sometimes people get replaced peter uh, bernard holly at the end of tomb of the cybermen one uh, but sometimes like at uh, balan in the dominators they actually replace the actor 
um, having done the cliffhanger um, so they don't have to pay him. I love this bit. I used to... Uh, and, and look at Tom Baker's face. He's so good. That, that anger, that danger. But I love this relatively... You know you know how they do it. He's, and that's why he's walking a bit funny is because he's walked backwards and turned around uh, and they've, you know, they've discharged the shot. But it's so well done. Uh, and it's it's sort of simple, but it's not because it's... But it's seamless. And again, it's done without too much fanfare. It's just like, this is the sort of thing that happens. Uh, and that's a, and it's a clever cut from the film of, uh, you know, George Tovey to the studio exterior, if you like, of the shattered glass and that wonderful cadaverous face uh, of Bernard Archard, who is so coldly menacing. Oh, oh, the holes. That's the first time I have noticed that is... Uh, that the jacket doesn't have... Oh, no, because the hole closed up. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. See, I'm, I'm the, the ghosts of my old sixth form college friends are uh, dancing in my memories. Um, I love that bit where the with, with the, the effect of the of the shotgun uh, going back in. Um, it's, it's not just that this is a good... You know, they talk about Paddy Russell being an actor's director and the acting is... is, is flawless this i also think it's a brilliantly designed show i think christine rusco has done a fantastic job but it's the sort of stuff that the bbc does very well but the the merging of the sort of futuristic and the ancient gothic and the 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 historical setting it's a you know, it's almost three different time zones really even though the the mummies sort of represent even two because they're futuristic but they're also from the past and they're from the past even in this setting that we're in the passed in if uh, if you get my drift um and it all but it all merges together so well so there's incongruity but a bit like the doctor's costume it all it all is of the same universe it all somehow sort of fits um and i mean the, the it's just, like the web of fear which i have invoked um what pyramids of mars is about doesn't actually stand that much scrutiny but i couldn't give two hoots because it's done with such conviction um and i think sometimes you know the the great trick of doctor who is to is to is to paper over the the, the cracks and 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 I, I think much like some modern politicians have realized we 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 don't have to we don't have to um pretend we're nice you know let's let's just be horrible and people will forgive us if if they like the cut of our jib i think you know th this story doesn't go to great lengths in terms of its story and its and and, and the script to 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 hide the fact that it's uh it, it 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 doesn't bear much scrutiny in terms of the the plot um but it it trusts the way that it tells its story that we don't really think about the fact of going well this seems a very if what what how come he's got all the bits to build the rocket and if he can give them the bits to build the rocket how come he can't it's go oh, anyway it doesn't matter and it because it doesn't it doesn't really matter because it it you you follow these two characters so willingly and you buy into the production a hundred percent because of the quality of of both both um uh and and this this is a, it's funny this this bit i know russell t davis was gonna have have an an, an element of this uh, or was gonna actually replicate this scene in in one of his uh episodes in the first year when he brought Doctor Who back it's seen as a key moment it it, it, it was it's funny because I never sort of needed it I didn't I didn't need I, I just took on trust that you know if if where they are now dies that wipes everything out so I, I but I know I know you know people view this scene as very important and it is and it's very very well done and I, I love that that model work you know is the again this 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 period of Doctor Who even has, you know, for, for for just a split second moment like that, it's really well rendered. the 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 CSO is very good. The model is very good. Um, I'm from 1980. Oh, and let, let's not even get started on the whole 1980 business. But um, 
it's just for the questioning audience. It's a very clever way of just going, so don't ask that question again. So I suppose in, you know, 12 years into the show <laughs> to go, it's just by the way, in case you were wondering. Uh, and then if anybody asks later, they go, oh no, there was an episode back in 1975 where they got that covered. So it's, yeah, I suppose it's useful. <laughs> but, you know, time travel, it probably it's helpful if you don't think about it too much. Again, just go with the adventure. We could have, you know, we could spend ages sitting around and explaining a reason why. Um, but should we not just get on with the adventure? So actually that's a very economical uh, and useful sort of stopgap just to go, yeah, in case you were wavering. I think that's a brilliant shot of those two mummies and poor old Ernie Clements. Uh, uh, but this, I remember my, yeah, my school friends hooting at this because... I don't know. I think I think I think the gate is good. They and bless them because that's hard terrain and they can't really see. He nearly goes over then, but but they're they're they're, they're sort of in in sync as well, and that's hard to do in a big mummy costume on a on a on a on a sort of incline like that on probably fairly bumpy terrain. Uh, and I think I think they're a great image. Uh, so oh, and he's going to bang into the wall, poor guy. Um, and and it's you know they're inexorable these guys this you know this is proper terrifying tea time stuff um and it's it's the it's the mixture of past and futuristic that i think that doctor who does so well it's the mixture of science fiction and gothic horror that doctor who does so well it's a look this is summer this is bright i don't know this isn't darkness this isn't moonlit which would be so expensive and hard to do and yet it's still terribly creepy and terribly scary it's sort of counterintuitive um uh, you know it it, it it goes against what you imagine how you imagine these things should be done and i'm sure if you were doing a lot of this now you would set it at night um but it works oh dear. now i'm sure gabriel wolf wasn't actually supposed to be in this episode he's not credited i'm certain of that this is where i might end up with egg on my face i've got a feeling did they bring this scene forward because this episode was underrunning? That's something for you to do at, to do for your homework at home. But I'm sure because I remember again when I saw this in episodical form, go why isn't Sutek credited? Because he's definitely in it. But I, th I yeah. Uh, but then what happened in between the Doctor and Co going out of the window and us coming here? There must have been a bit in between. Maybe a bit of Clements. I'm anyway. That's something for you to do for your homework. This is not 100% factual. This is me off the top of my head. Because if I had to research every podcast I did, I would do nothing else, not even breathe. Uh, and I'm sure some of you would find that preferable. But there we go. I've listened to some podcasts where there's all sorts of conjecture that if they just looked in a book, they'd realise was wrong. So I'm making no apology. I think... Uh, something of what I said there was accurate and if it means that you go and look it up and you learn something then good for you if it means you already knew it and you're going ha ha I know something he doesn't uh, th that's a victory that you will enjoy as well so everybody wins uh, <laughs> uh, Michael Sheard is so easy to underestimate because he was ubiquitous and, and sort of became a bit of a joke I remember I remember um, SFX magazine sort of, you know d d uh, very friendlily taking the mickey out of the fact they'd you know they'd do they'd, they'd list all their the guests at all the conventions that month and you know michael sheard michael sheard went to all of them because he was very enthusiastic and a very very nice guy and i think that's the danger because when you become so ubiquitous and familiar to fans uh, i i think sometimes we can then lose sight of why we like them in the first place and it's almost like we respect you more which is why you know certain actors who uh who regulate their appearances. You know, it's part of Peter Kay, the comedian's appeal, uh, is that he knows that people can get sick of you. So he he very much chooses his moments. Uh, whereas Michael Sheard chose every moment to go to every convention if he could. And he's, look at that, that, that cutaway shot of him uh, hearing... Uh, and, 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 you know, he's, he's the traditional, you know, helpful associate character, except Doctor Who's really horrible to him. Um, and gets quite annoyed by him, and he dies, um, which, you know, and in a lot of stories, his character, he would he would survive. Uh, Clements' death is quite, I remember th this being written about as, 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 you know, pretty 
uh, startling. You know, he's crushed to death between the mummy's tits. Um, but again, my friends found that silly. And in fact, I think my sister watched it with me once and she said, oh, did he die? Because cause you hear the gunshot and then, you know, he falls for, oh, did he get shot then? So, and I'm going, no, it's a gruesome moment where he gets crushed to death. Um, uh, so having read about it as this, you know, great scary moment other other people witnessing it was was always a bit of a disappointment to me but it is a it's a it's a pretty grim death isn't it and they and they do it as you know they do as much with it as you can at a at a at a, at a saturday tea time um oh she holds that quite a long time because of course i'm not used to the the cliffhangers well done she kept acting uh you'd cut away from that slightly quicker i'd say these days um but yeah, the crushing of crushing. So Ernie Clements, bless him, doesn't meet anybody else and just spends the whole thing being being chased or in trouble or banging into a force field. Uh, but I remember he gets he's much higher on the credits on the VHS compilation. Uh, oh, gosh, he's 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 bottom because, of course, Sutek does not get a credit. I was right. See, I haven't even seen that that much. This one that much. But I knew Sutek wasn't credited on episode two. But George Tovey is credited, I think third after after archard and uh and sheared uh in uh, on the vhs compilation whereas it's actually, it's actually near the bottom there because it is it's a very very small part uh, anyway nobody cares about that apart from me um so <laughs> um but yeah he's uh that that's that's a uh, bless him that's his one contribution um now listen what's my favorite thing about that and what will be Richard Bignall's favourite thing? Will he choose the Ernie Clement subplot, which which serves, you know, it it it, it absolutely works for all this for all the short screen time that we spend with him. Um, you know, he provides us with the person whose explosives are going to be used in the next episode. Uh, he shows us that you can't escape. That's a by the way, I haven't even talked about that. The fact that brilliant, we're all we're all enclosed in this particular space uh so you know we can't get away even if we wanted to uh, except to 1980 which has been destroyed because we haven't done the business here uh, so that's a really good way of saying you know you you've got to you've got to stay here or and possibly die or die um and uh and he does and he does that brilliant bit to show that marcus scarman can't be killed and then he adds to the list of casualties brilliant um so i i wonder if richard will choose that but i i think i would be untrue to myself if i didn't choose the bit where marcus garman is shot and then the smoke comes back into him and you know the the explosion is undone uh because i just think it's 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 emblematic of the whole story whereas it's a it's a it's a brilliantly staged moment that is done with um, skill economy very little fanfare and just fits seamlessly into the rest of it and it is it, just you know a, a mark of its quality and i just remember as a kid thinking these are the these are the moments that that make doctor who really exciting uh, and i still think it's you know it's 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 pretty good for now um so i'm choosing the bit where ernie clements shoots Professor Scarman and uh, and the effect is reversed. So, what will Richard Bignall choose? Now, I have to admit, part two was something of a tough one for me because there were several different things that I could have picked for this episode. But my choice this time are the mummies themselves. So, why have I chosen them? Well, first off, I think the mummies are a terrific design. They echo what had been seen in the old Universal and Hammer mummy films, whilst absolutely providing their own take on the creature. But the main reason I've chosen them for this episode is one particular factor, and this is something that has really stuck with me ever since I saw the story over 45 years ago. I love the fact that they are slow moving. You see, throughout Doctor Who's history, you've had a myriad of monsters and creatures that haven't exactly been the quickest to get from A to B. But more often than not, that's been about necessity 
rather than design. I guess in, if you encase a man in thick rubber and fiberglass and then reduce his vision down to absolutely nothing, it's hardly surprising that the job in, in, actor inside won't be pacing along at a rate of knots. Or in the case of Mestor, not at all. But with the mummies, however, their slow speed appears to have been a deliberate decision. The script actually refers to them as lumbering when they move. And that's exactly what we see with their pursuit of poor Ernie Clements in this episode. These creatures don't need to move fast. They don't need speed. With their prey trapped within the confines of a force field and unable to escape, they just constantly pursue, pursue, pursue until they finally catch up with you. It rather reminds me of that line in the original Terminator film, where Carl Reese says to Sarah Connor, that Terminator is out there. It can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear, and it will absolutely not stop ever until you are dead. In fact, in my mind, this is probably an idea that hasn't really been played out again in Doctor Who until 2015 and the Peter Capaldi story, Heaven Sent, where, of course, the Doctor's trapped in this ever-changing castle in the sea, being slowly but continually pursued by this mysterious, tall, shrouded figure that is simply called The Veil in the closing credits. Funnily enough, though, it also reminds me of the BBC sketch show Big Train from around the early 2000s. I think it was in the second series of that that in one edition they had this running gag about Kevin Eldon being pursued by Mark Heap dressed as the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And every so often we would cut back to Eldon's character, getting more and more panicked as he tried to flee the Tin Man, who was slowly but unstoppingly pursuing him with this constant, repetitive, menacing music playing in the background as he made his way up the road. Back in 1975, I found the mummies catching up with Ernie and then crushing him to death as they body slammed each other against their angled chest. Absolutely horrifying. And then, of course, the gun goes off and the mummies pursue the Dr. Sarah and Lawrence Scarman back to his lodge where they are trapped in a terrifying cliffhanger. Now, of course, the mummy service robots run throughout this story, but it's really in part two where they really come to the fore. And that is why they are my favourite aspect of this particular episode. Oh, he's good, isn't he? He's really thought about this. And of course he can absolutely quote accurately Michael Beard's speech from The Terminator. Of course he can. And then cross-reference it with Big Train. This guy knows what he's talking about. Um, he's right about the mummies. Um, and of course, they kill Ernie Clements just before uh, the end of episode two. So he doesn't have to get paid for another episode. And we don't see his corpse later on, uh, unlike uh, Narmin's. Um, uh, yeah, and I think, yeah, he's right about the mummies. And I hadn't thought about that, you know, the slow, inexorable thing. And of course, because we're surrounded by a force field, it doesn't matter if they're slow because they won't tire. Uh, and we've got limited places to go. Um, they are and they are a really good design and I love that target book cover um, the original one that, that 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 has has it as the central image with the doctor and with Sarah with the gun that you know that was the stuff that you looked at when this is when doctor was you know really grown up and it is it is grown up for tea time melodrama adventure you know it's 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 there's 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 nothing phony about it it's uh you know, it's staged with absolute commitment. And that includes the design of the mummies. That is, it's a really good design. It's a really good costume design, even though they have tits. <laughs> but it, that works. Um, but it also means I can say, uh, uh, yeah, Richard was much better. He said they're body, they body slam and crush him. Whereas I said he was he was crushed by their tits. But, you know, it's the same thing, but with a different approach. Um, but I, th and I wonder, you know, I wonder, I probably would have chosen them if I didn't have the spectre of my old college friends, you know, saying, it's like when my, uh, I was doing the Choose Your Own Adventures by Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson, Jackson, fighting fantasy. Uh, and I got really into those. And, and, and I remember saying to my brother, it's great because you choose which way you go. And, you know, if you choose the wrong way, you, you die and then you have to start again. And he said, well, why would you start again? Why didn't you just go back to the bit where you made the wrong decision and carry on from there? And that had not occurred to me 
and it it was like Santa Claus all over. It absolutely ruined it for me. And and I think in a bit in that way of having it had this on after a party with my you know seventeen eighteen year old friends seventeen we were sixteen seventeen uh, and then seeing flaws in it that just hadn't occurred to me that I was blind to um, uh, that even though I didn't agree with them it just slightly slightly sullied them uh, even though the, I think they're great and I think my friends were wrong but I still cannot escape that association uh, that stinging disappointment um, other people they ruin everything don't they <laughs> and with that in mind I'm going to end this episode and go on to Twitter to see what uh, folk have made of the latest uh, Doctor Who DVD and Blu-ray releases <laughs> what could possibly go wrong but until next time oh mummy ta-ta Thank you for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock. My special guest for Pyramids of Mars is Richard Bignall, who can be found on Twitter at Nothing Lane. Nothing Lane. And he's well worth doing so. I'd also like to thank my patrons, who include Luke Atkins, Peter Adamson, Will Brooks, Richard Byatt, Alex Kafajoglu, Paul Carnahan, Andy Case, Richard Chalk, John Curley, Mark Dakin, John Ellidge, Gary Gillett, James Gould, Lisa C. Greco, Dave Hoskin, Jessica Jones, Andrew Jordan, Ashley Knight, Clive Lewis, Guy Lambert, James Lark, Gavin McLean, Nathan Martin, David Matthewman, John McClay, Rossi McPhillips, Stuart Mitchell and Nathan Moore. The music for this podcast was composed by Dave Gates and the podcast artwork is by Dylan Patterson. And if you would like to join that list of names, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. Tiers start for as little as £3 a month. And if you sign up for a year, you get a 10% discount on top of even that. There you will find exclusive interviews, bonus releases and advanced material and a few videos and little knickknacks and bits and bobs scattered about like gold nuggets of TV arcana presented by an anthropomorphised anorak. That's me, by the way. Uh, if you can't do that uh, or don't want to, that's fine. Um, you can go to kopi.com forward slash Toby Haydock if ever you listen to anything that makes you think he could probably do with a cup of coffee uh, and it could be a cup of coffee worth any amount you like uh, that's just another way of, uh, of you know, funding these things but you know on a perhaps a more ad hoc basis uh, but if you can't do either of those things and I totally understand if that's the case you know what you can do you can go to wherever you get your podcasts especially uh, Apple you know the iTunes place uh, and give a five star rating and even perhaps some lines saying why you like these, because that helps to make these stand out from the crowd and strut their peacock feathers and get the attention and the wows, and most importantly, the downloads, because that's what they need. And it means I'm not sitting in this cupboard alone, talking rubbish, uh, to no avail. So if you could do that, I'd be very, very grateful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Toby Haydock. These podcasts have their own stream at Haydock Podcasts. And I do a comedy night called Excess Malarkey every Tuesday in Manchester at 8pm. Uh, but there's a monthly iteration of that show on the first Sunday of every month at twitch.tv forward slash Excess Malarkey. And even if you go there now, there is an archive of previous those shows and all the ones we did during lockdown. But the live show is the first Sunday of every month at 8 p.m. So bob along to that as well. Uh, it's not all. It's not really about Doctor Who, but there's fine comics from all over the world. I'm not just about Doctor Who, you know. I know that's all you're interested in me for, though. I do. I do. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, what? I'm being heckled now. What was that? That, did you hear that? That was what my dearly beloved said. That's what. That's all she thinks I'm about. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was that was a little bit of reality creeping into the uh, the post credit sequence there. I hope you like that. I didn't. Bye. Bye.